Welcome to King's Bishop Teaches Chess. I'm Coach Daniel, your host, also known as King's Bishop, here at chess.com. And I'm bringing another installment of World Championship Wins. Today's game was the fifth game in a match between Johannes Zuckertort and Wilhelm Steinitz. The match terms were that draws would not count and the first person to win 10 games would be declared the world champion. If there was a 9-9 tie, neither player would obtain the title. And I probably should not have shown the end position, letting the cat out of the bag. But um, we have yet another Slav defense that we'll see today. Now, the match began January 11th, 1886. The games were played in New York at Cartier's Hall on Fifth Avenue. And this would be the last game of the New York portion of the match. They played Monday, Wednesday, Friday until either player would reach four points. Once that occurred, they'd move to the next city, which in this case was St. Louis. And that's where the match resumed on February 3rd. Now, once Steinitz reached four points, the match then moved to New Orleans. And it uh, was a couple of weeks after that fourth point, that fourth victory by Steinitz um, occurred on February 10th. But then not until February 26th was the match resumed in New Orleans, Louisiana. And it was there that Steinitz ultimately prevailed on March 29, 1886, with a final score of 10 wins for Steinitz, 5 wins for Zuckertort, and 5 draws. Now we'll not look at the 5 draws, but we do intend to look at all 15 decisive games and then we'll move on to another match. Okay, so D4, D5, C4, C6. The Slav defense once again. And Circuitort wisely develops his knight in this line. And after knight C3, knight F6, E3, Bishop to f5 is played here. And in this time, instead of pushing the pawn forward, as we saw in previous games, Zuckertort trades on d5. C takes d5. And now we can see that the pawn on b7 is undefended. So queen to b3 attacks that pawn, which is where the ECO coverage ends. And bishop c8 is played to defend it. Now, frankly, I don't really understand the point of getting your bishop out of bed and two moves later, putting it back to bed. 
but the move has been played 140 times since that time by masters. In other words, if you were to look at this position in the masters database here at chess.com, you'll find this game and 140 others listed that resulted in bishop c8 here. It's the most common response. The second most common response that would make more sense to me is knight c6. Waking up another piece, even though it gives away the pawn. In the database, the continuation is bishop d7, queen b3, rook b8, queen d1, and e5 giving white a couple of choices, either knight f3, something along these lines. Or, um, instead of knight f3, the other option that is played is taking the pawn right away with this continuation. And you have pretty much the same thing either way, just different move order. And now let's come back here. You can see here, and, and at least especially here, black has four pieces out of bed to white's one lonely knight out of bed. And all of these guys snoozing for a bruising. And so the lead in development is ample compensation to black for the sacrificed pawn. So that's the line I can understand. The line that was played that I don't understand is undeveloping the bishop to protect this pawn here. All right, so we're leaving the Encyclopedia of Chess openings behind now. But we're still in the database with knight f3, knight c6, and now knight e5, which if you've heard my lessons at all, you hear me say don't move the same piece twice when you have people in bed. And, um, of course, all of these principles I give you come with the caveat, unless you have a very, 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 very good reason. And here, White's idea is to try to entice Black to capture the knight. But... After the recapture, Black's other knight is deflected away from the defense of d5, which is super attacked by the queen and the knight. And once that king's knight moves away, d5 will be overpowered. And so... E6 defends the D pawn. And Bishop B5. And Queen C7 shows up four times in the database. So it's pretty rare. On principle, I sing I, I sing my song about letting the bishop and the knight lead in the fight. So on principle, and in the database, the most common move 
bishop d7. Not only getting another piece out of bed, but breaking the pin. And so that is the most frequently played move in the database here. So queen c7. It's been tried a few times, but not very popular. Bishop d2. And now bishop d6. Setting up a battery against the e5 knight. And white only has the one defender. And so f4 super defends the knight on e5. And of course white is planning to castle, so if black wants to capture here, he's giving white a half-open file. Black castles, rook to c1, getting on the open file and in line with the opponent's queen. And now bishop takes e5 is unique to this game. Um, in the database, there's only one other game that reached this position, and that was between um, Antoinetta Stefanova and Humpy Canero, both grandmasters. Um, sorry, I, I wanted to get the link here and paste it in the chat here. So let me capture that. It's not allowing me to do it. Now, but the game was played in Beijing, China in December 2012 at the Sport Accord World Mind Games Women's Rapid Tournament. Well, it was... The tournament was not just for women. women. There was a women's section. That I can give you here. Um, let me paste the link right here. And you can read about that tournament. And you can find the game in the database as well here at chess.com. Just for some reason not finding. Here it is. I forgot that I had it in the other window. So let me give you that link as well. All right. So the first link will take you to the official web page of the tournament. And the second link will take you to the game here at chess.com. I think I've got that. I don't know why the other link disappeared. Maybe it's just... Okay, there you go. You've got them both now. Let me just bring that down a little so... You can see them both. All right. In any case, in that game, Stefanova played a6. Okay, in this game, Steinitz captures on e5. And f takes e5. 
knight to e8. No doubt planning to push the F man. White castles. And F6 is in fact played. Striking at the center of the board here. Bishop d3. But because of bishop d3, pawn takes e5 is not a possibility. Why? Because there's a deflection available to white here. And I'm sure you see it in three, two, one, check. And the king has to leave the rook undefended. So for that reason, the pawn is moved again. Oh no, he played um, rook, my mistake. He played rook to f7. Rook to f7. Queen to c2, creating a battery against h7, provokes the pawn to move again to f5. Now knight to e2. Of course, you have this queen and the rook forming a battery on the open c file. You've got white repositioning his pieces toward the opponent's king. Bishop d7, desperately trying to get his pieces in the game. And rook to f2 is a pretty passive move here. Perhaps he's planning to double his rooks on the f-file. But with this battery aiming across here and this rook aiming up here, the more active move would be g4, creating an enormous four-piece attack against f5. After g6, pawn takes, pawn takes. Well, now we have an open g file. King would sidestep with the idea of now attacking on that g file. Rook f2, however, was the move. And rook to c8. Bishop c3. And in a moment we'll see the purpose of this move is to make way for the queen. Queen b6 and queen d2 is played. Knight e7. And knight e7 leaves the square a5. To the mercy of this battery. With the knight on c6. It can't be played. But here it can be. But it's not. Instead, the doubling of the rooks that we talked about earlier is played. And, of course, White's preference to make this rook battery is understandable with the half-open f-file. But again, having formed this queen-bishop battery... Bishop a5. Is an appealing move. 
Well, black would have to trade off rooks. And then move his queen to safety. And okay. White has a slight advantage here. Circuitort prefers the rook battery on the half open F file. Bishop B5. And white does not want to trade his bishops. Number one, he has the bishop pair. Number two, his light squared bishop is ready to pounce in the direction of h7 once the b1 h7 diagonal opens up. Queen a6, battering the knight although it's amply defended. And now finally g4. And this is an interesting note about initiative. Back here, um, when he played rook f2, Having the initiative, g4 would have been called for at this point. So it was a little slow getting g4 in the works here. g6, h3, rook c7, and now rook e1 unpinning the knight. He's decided now that Knight f4 is the move. But with the rook on f1, that bishop on b5 with, creates a pin. Knight to g7, just bringing in more pieces to defend and obstruct knight f4 and knight c8 pretty passive move here there are three kinds of moves in the game of chess that always seem to be the best active move excuse me Active moves, checks, threats, captures. So the active move in this position, g5, sending the knight away, back into his own house. Knight to c8 is not a check, a threat, or a capture. Connects the rooks. It might eventually lead to a threat on the queen. That's going to take a long time. Well, now G takes F5. And apparently Steinitz did not learn his lesson from the previous game. And, and you'll remember in that game, Steinitz allowed a file on his king's side to be opened for Zuckertort's rooks to infiltrate his king's position. And here again, he opens a file upon which his opponent will be able to infiltrate. So here, and, and really at this point, white's got an advantage either way. But keeping the G file at least half closed 
will be a bit better and the night is a little bit better there as well that's not to say that that can't still be broken open but with g takes f5 the path is already open without any additional breakage being necessary for white and of course rook g2 is immediately played king f8 king h2 queen c6 rook a to g1 Knight to e7. Queen to f2, bringing all the attackers over to the king's side. Queen e8. And now, rook takes rook. Excuse me, rook takes knight. And here, black went ahead and resigned. Because <laughs> with the knight back on e7, the pawn on e6 is undefended. And as you can see here, if black wants to attempt to recoup his material, he'd have to take with the rook. And white would simply... Take back with his own rook. And now the rook can't be captured without a fork being played. And now another fork. And here even... White doesn't have to take the bishop for simplification because he's got a bigger attack with that bishop that he tucked away just for this opportunity. Now the F file is cleared for the queen. Check. Defend. And it's going to be mate right here and so he resigned back here this is where black resigned now white's accuracy in this game was 95.78 his best move percentage was 53.1. Black had a paltry 78.04 accuracy with a best move ratio of 35.5%. So not Steinitz's best day. But those days are behind him and that water is under the bridge and though Zuckertort enjoys a four to one lead at the end of the New York leg he'll only go on to win one more game in the remaining 15 games and uh We'll look at those games in future videos. I hope you enjoyed this one. Please consider um, donating to my channel through my PayPal account. And you can actually... Let me just put the link here in the screen as well. So you can support the channel by going to this page
and you can make a donation directly to me there. And all donations will be received with great appreciation and will help the channel and help me to provide more videos. So please consider supporting the channel. Otherwise, if you're not able to, please continue to enjoy the videos. I don't want you to feel compelled, but if you're able to, I appreciate your support. Okay, so until next time, have a great day and play some great chess. Bye now.